right? So how do I bless as many people, especially my little family, to go for a thousand generations? Like, let's have a 500 year view. Welcome to the Deep Dark, a business podcast where we ask seasoned minds to excavate their history, pulling out the best insights, the hardest moments, and yes, golden epiphanies. Somewhere in the stories and laughs, we all get a little smarter and feel a little better about our own business ventures. Remember, if it didn't hurt, it doesn't count. Your hosts are Chris Lyon and Tim Douglas at the Fidelis Creative Agency. So strap in and get ready as we plunge once again into the deep dark. If you've ever marveled at the genius behind filming, you'll appreciate today's conversation with Andrew Kilzer. Andrew runs Texas Filmworks out of College Station, Texas. With over a decade of experience in film and the film industry, Andrew has a fascinating set of insights. Enjoy the conversation on this episode of The Deep Dark. Welcome to The Deep Dark Podcast, uh, brought to you by Fidelis, I'm guessing. My name is Andrew Kilzer. Uh, Chris has brought me on today to talk about my business, Texas Filmworks. Uh, We'll get into The Deep Dark. We'll talk about kind of where things are going, and and I'm sure we'll find some things that I wasn't even thinking Chris would ask me about. (laughs) But thanks for having me on, Chris, and welcome to your show. Well, thank you for being on my show. I feel like I'm the guest, but you know what? You did a heck of a job. I uh, think there may be a future for you behind the mic. I I like to be behind the camera more than I'm in front of the camera. So, yeah. uh, but I can I can sometimes pull it out, right. and make it make it work. Well, yeah. you 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 got the plug, Texas Filmworks. So tell mm-hmm. everybody about Texas Filmworks. Real quick. Yeah. So Texas Filmworks is a group that we spun up in 2016. Uh-huh. Um, Texag. So I'm a part of the Texags organization, um, and and Texags had had really gotten into the media space uh, with Texas Radio. And then uh, when Anna moved to the SEC with the the film, the award-winning film, which I wasn't a part of, but SEC Ready, mm-hmm. uh, full-length documentary, feature-length documentary. Um, and there was really this, this sense that there was need for higher level production in this community. And there's a few people doing some things, but uh, Brandon Jones, the CEO of the organization I'm a part of, and I realized, hey, there's a there's a market here. Um, and so in 2016, after starting my career at TechSags and then bouncing around a couple of other places, including the university, we, we realized, hey, let's start what we then called TPG or TechSags Production Group. Okay. We've since lost the name TechSags and it's Texas Filmworks. We feel like if we can sort of own the state of Texas mm-hmm. with what we do, it's a pretty good market and we're, we're doing okay there. How much of what you do is actually for athletics anymore? Um, I don't really do anything for the athletic space. Okay. The, the Texags organization is, is owned by a partnership called Maroon and White, and they, they function three different businesses. There's Texags, which is the big dog. They cover all things A&M mm-hmm. sports and recruiting. There's F5 Sports, where um, they've taken the platform, the CMS, the content management system that runs Texags, and they license it to other groups. Wow. Uh, I think that's still a plan sure. to do that more and more because it's a really impressive system. And then there's Texas Filmworks. Right. So we don't really cover athletics much. I did a lot of that for a number of years. I covered A&M football and basketball and recruiting. Um, the first job I had was taking recruit photos and getting into SQL Server, which you should never let a guy like me onto a SQL Server database. I'm bound to mess something up. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. But wow. you know, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting what you what you where you're going with that because it it just comes to mind about all the things that you've done as you've started to learn your craft, right? You've been you've been through it, starting out as a photographer, from what I remember, all the way through you know the video work that you do now. What how, what is what is your volume year after year? I mean, is, is there a big market for video, and not just here but elsewhere? Yeah, there's a huge market for video, and I think we're only starting to scratch the surface on that. So I go back to um, a conversation I had with with a guy that um, I really respect years ago, and I was like, "Do I need to go learn how to program? Like, do mm-hmm. I need to learn how to code?" He's like, "No, you don't need to learn how to code. There's always going to be somebody that can code for you." Uh, what you need to do is learn how to speak what they're doing and understand it enough to sort of set that team in a direction. Mm. This is when I was thinking about doing something different. But I really think about video kind of in the same way. There's always going to be somebody younger or somebody with a better eye um, or somebody who is going to think about something differently. Um, and so I didn't go to school for this. I was telling you when we were kind of getting ready, when, right. when Ryan was working his magic over here behind the mixer, um, that I was, I was going to be a teacher – um, 
and and that was really my the path I thought I was going to go on. I never I took some photography class in high school or whatever, but it wasn't something I felt like this is what I have to do. Now doing that stuff, I, I still enjoy it. I love having uh, making something that's beautiful. But honestly, Chris, there's always going to be somebody that's better behind right. the camera Absolutely. than I am, better editor. But I feel like if I can help set a direction, if I can set a path into something, that's where I feel like I've I've understood more about myself i come mm-hmm. alive when i kind of point my team in a direction and let them do their best job to kind of get there and i i get the team thing i, I you know great leader great manager that texas filmworks has done great what is it that you love most about the videoing and film piece of that i love the initial ideation stage the most mm-hmm. i think that's the part of it i love i love sitting down with a client you know understanding who they are what their business is about what their sort of challenge or pain point is and um and trying to figure out one is my team the right team to do this i've started lately saying hey we're probably not the best here how does that make you feel it feels really good (laughs) it feels really good to say hey we're probably not the right fit right um but i love that that stage of hey here's some ideas getting a getting the college students that work with us kind of around the table we did this a couple weeks ago and just letting them kind of run and me saying hey i think that's something the client would enjoy or right. you should think that over again before you say that out loud but you know there's just that's that's a lot of fun for me and i really really um when i was a kid my mom would we'd be driving somewhere and she'd say hey think of every job you can that starts with the letter p and we would just kind of run through this ideation stage and i think it kind of goes back to that like i just really enjoy that it's probably the most creative part in the for sure yeah when you get there, the rest of it is a lot of detail and scheduling and stuff that i do but it's not stuff i really like come alive doing so when you're doing this ideation piece is are you having a vision in your head of what this is going to end up looking like before you even begin i have an idea typically but i i really have had to train myself to to let that go because what I want to do is set my team off on a path and say, this is what it needs to accomplish. This is sort of the vehicle I think it needs to be done in. Tip, you know, that's video. But even within that, like, this is the sort of parameters. And then you go do it. Because then it, it, it takes the ownership out of my hands from being, it has to do this and it has to be these things to, this is what it needs to do. Now you go bring it to life. And I feel like then what that's doing is it's taking it, they're able to to come alongside sort of the vision that the client and I have had, and they're able to make it their own. And then everybody kind of walks away feeling like I had a real part in in doing this. Yeah. They weren't just kind of checking off a list, and I wasn't um, driving something that might not have been the right way. Sure, so. you know, there's a there's a piece of literature out there these days. I don't have it in front of me. I wish that we could be like Rogan and have it pop up on the screen. But I'll give you. Hey the, Ryan, bring this up. Yeah, Ryan, thanks. Maybe next time. But I was thinking when you were saying that, I was thinking about it. So a bunch of economists got together and they wanted to figure out what the driver of of actual your team was. And and it's not a generational thing. This is this took this took multiple multiple generations and multiple geographies to get mm-hmm. to it. And so what the common thinking was is that the driver for most teams and most people in business is profit. Okay. Profit motive. Sure. And and what they found is that's not true. And so they went through geography. They went all around. And what they found is as long as you could pay people just enough to where they weren't worried about tomorrow. But then in turn, what you did is you actually gave them ownership of what they were about to build. And you actually allowed them to be creative and to actually create something that the ability to keep a happy employee was longer than if you paid them based upon merit of how much money they brought in Mm -hmm. and in turn how much you shared with them it's not really as big of a deal Mm -hmm. as you think but i hear that in what you're saying yeah right it is interesting because you know as you sort of grow in your career you're like i'm not making enough get married you have kids like but then you do get to a point where you're like i i have what i need right this is great um and i'd buy if there wasn't some profit motivation i work for guys that want me to make money and that's part of it but but the other side of that too is i think um, I read, I think it was on Forbes or some Facebook article that came up, but it was the, the number one sign of a bad manager is that they weren't able to give credit to the team, that they took credit for everything. And so I think mm-hmm. if you pair that with what you're saying, that people want to really be able to own what they're doing, and they also just want the credit for doing good work. They do. And so Big the more, yeah, the, the thing that I've actually learned a lot from Tim and Mark is sort of like how do we go through and and support our organization in ways where they can do good work right and so that's that's really what i want to be about is how do i support these guys to do really good work and then let them have the win there you go 
I get a win when they get a win and the client does. That's that's the exciting part. But yeah. if I had to pick one thing, it's really the like sit down and have fun. That is the fun something. part. Uh-huh. So you you had talked to me when we were getting ready for this about the about the four pillars that you run your business under. Mm-hmm. What are those four pillars? You yeah, so we want to do things based on these four pillars. One is we want to do excellent work in anything we do, meaning uh-huh. we don't want to cut corners. Uh, we don't want to take the easy way out. We'll do something the easy way if that's the right way, but we want to do sure. it the right way. We want to honor the people we work with and we work for. Mm-hmm. We want to do work. We want to do our work with the gratitude, uh, because not everybody gets to have fun coming up with ideas. There's people that that do really hard things and don't get to ideate every day. And then we want to have fun doing what we're doing. My feeling is, if I could work with excellence, honor, gratitude, and fun, I could probably work on an assembly line. And as long as I can find those four things, I'm going to go home and feel like I had a pretty good day. And so, yeah. my team, Truth. if they, if I feel like if if they're able to come alongside me with that, um, we're all going to just be able to work together in a way that's pretty good. Well, on this journey, you know, the big question is, what sucked? What was the hardest thing that you had to do as you started to grow this business and run this business that you're in? Yeah, there's there's a few things. Uh, one, if you've run media, you've lost a file. Like I just I do not believe any videographer anywhere that says they've never lost a file or a photographer. Like everybody does that, and and for the first time you have to call a client and say, "Hey, I lost this thing and I can't <laughs> redo it." That's a really really painful moment. Yeah. yeah. Um. Or it happens. And it's happened to me more times than I want to right. admit, right? Like that's really, really hard. And that's that's been a really big pain point. And so there's a lot I have a lot of support around me that I've built where that's not let that doesn't rest on me because I'll screw it up. Um the other thing though has been getting um getting a team around me that's that's bought into what I'm about. I, I think about it like if if the Lord has given me this this plot of land right? I'm responsible for the fruit and for the, the growth of on this small plot of land mm-hmm. in Bryan College Station. And so I want to do the best job I can um, sort of tilling that and making sure that that's in a good place. And there's been, you know, there's been some days where it was really, really hard because something didn't work out or I had to make a hard call to a client or something like that. But um, yeah, I think the those are the, those are the things that were really hard, but then I feel like we've kind of come through that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of people that air quotes here in charge have a real hard time casting that vision. The vision casting is tough, mm-hmm. right? Because not ultimately is everybody going to get on board, but you have to be influential enough, and there has to be enough trust that's going on there that people actually want to follow. How do you cast that vision? What tell us how? What is there? Is there a sequence in your head that says, "All right, I'm now going to do this. I'm now going to," or is it just impromptu? How, how do you do that? Yeah, I don't know that I've ever really thought about this, Chris. I'll, I'll kind of just talk it through here sure. uh, out loud as Ryan smiles at me from his control room over here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think a, if you work for somebody long enough, you pick up a lot of their idiosyncrasies Absolutely. in good and bad ways, Strengths right? And weaknesses, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Brandon Jones, uh, who is also a friend of the Fidelis shop, I've worked for him the majority yeah. of my professional career. Okay. And honestly, he's the best person at this that I've ever met because he sort of sets out, this is the ultimate place we need to go. And then he lets people sort of build the pathway there. He sets the 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 final destination. And then it he doesn't always care how you get there. Like mm-hmm. you have to do it with integrity and you have to do it sure. uh, with, with ethically and with other people in mind. But that's really how I've tried to set that up for myself. Um, you know, with my team where uh, what's, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'll say, Hey, we're, we're doing this project for this client. And, and a big part of a client relationship is one, you want to have that customer intimacy with somebody mm-hmm. where you're, you're having, they trust you, they lean on you for what, what you're really good at, but then you can also lean on them and there's sort of a give and take, right? Hopefully either you're both finding a mutual way to pay each other or, or, or whatever, but, um, that, that that's one thing that my team now does really well right and so we'll set this path and i've got guys that are really creative with the camera and they can they know like oh i'm i envision this shot this is how it's going to work 
And then one of my guys is like, I see the edit coming together in this way. And they're talking about that over here. Mm -hmm. And then our director of operations, Joe, he's sitting there thinking, how do I, how do I get this client to really feel the hospitality that our team brings? And so I love, uh, what, what I'm trying to do is, is emulate Brandon by saying, Hey, this is what we ultimately need. This is sort of the deliverable and the way we want to get there. But then I'm hoping that those guys are able to, to get excited because we're doing excellent work, because we're honoring each other and our clients, because we have some gratitude, mm -hmm. because we know we're going to get to have some fun while we're doing it. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that, Ryan. Um, but how do, we, how do we do those things and get to that finished product? Right. And I don't know that that totally answers your question, but I really want to set that long vision and say, we just need to do this and then support them to kind of get and there. And I'm sure that in that support to get there, you've already set up processes and guide rails in which people work within that helps you get to that vision. And then sure. it's muscle memory, right? Sure. I and mean, it's rinse and repeat. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked about this as we were starting. When I first started this business, when I first started doing video work, I was trying to, th I was trying to reinvent myself every project. And ultimately, that, that led to me doing things in a very scattered way, and nothing really was what I wanted it to be. Which is probably a good learning fail. It right? was great. Yeah, I yeah, failed yeah. forward many, many times. Great term. Um, but what, what I realized is that people, people started hiring me because they saw something I did. Well, they're hiring me because they liked the work. They don't, I don't want to do that exact same thing, but they, there's a framework that I realized we work really well in this framework. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like we've been able to develop a niche of, we do this well. And we're sort of unashamed at doing what we do really well. We do interview-driven, story-driven, uh, really beautiful B-roll, and a little bit of graphic work. I had somebody email the other day, and they're like, hey, we wrote, I wrote a script. Can you, can, you get, can you make a feature film? I'm like, I'm not the group for this. Or a guy called me, and he's like, hey, I want to pitch a TV show to the HGTV or Magnolia Network. I'm like, yeah. It's really not what I do. I'm, I'm not good at that. You should call one of these people who does this every day. Um, and I think people, when you do something well, they're hiring that, that thing that you do. Right. And, and I think as a creative, you're like, oh, I always have to do something new or different. But you look at really, really creative people, and they do their thing, and people hire it because they do that. I mean, that's a big learning. They have that feel. It's true. Creative people do have a niche. There yeah. are certain things that they do really, really, really well. You know, and I, I think the same is true for people that are leading organizations. Sure. And that's that's a big piece of it. It's not just what you have put out to the world. It's how you have run that team in the meantime, because that's that's really where you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. Right. Isn't that the learn? That's where you spend your time. That's where 90 percent of my time is at this point. Yeah. And I'm, I'm learning um, maybe not 90, maybe 70 percent of my time. But I'm learning that the more time I can put into that, the mm -hmm. better things turn out. Right. If I try to take Sets on, a, if I try try to take on a whole project myself at this point, uh, which there's times when that's necessary, but mm -hmm. I bog the team down. I don't, I don't help things along most of the time. Yep. I'm the one I, that's I, like I, I, changing I processes in the middle of a thing and like, no, no, no we do it this way. I'm yeah, like, don't, don't throw a grenade. Yeah, I'll right. get out of your way. Sure. Let me know if I can come along and <laughs> hang out. You know, because it's fun when that happens. Sure. Otherwise, let them work. Yeah. Who told you these truths? Who was the one that, that set you on the right path? Because obviously, you know, you brought yourself up to a certain extent, but there had to be someone who was influencing you and kind of giving you little tidbits of information and, and helping you. Who, who told you those truths? Yeah, I want to be known as a person who could admit when I don't know something. And I want to be really coachable and teachable. Um, those are things I just want to be true about myself. Um, and so definitely Brandon Jones who I've worked for most of my professional career has been that. Uh, my wife is really good at helping me sort of realize, yeah. hey, you're good at this. You kind of suck at this. <laughs> uh, I don't think she would ever use that word, but she's really good at kind of helping me get to that point. Um, my, and then just my, my, the group of guys I spend time around mm -hmm. these days are – are all men who are trying to get businesses going. They're all very entrepreneurial. They all realize that being beholden to someone else's time is not a way to, to succeed Absolutely. on a long-term scale. Right. And so um, these are all just people that I, if you're the, if you're the collection or if you're the, the combination of your five closest friends, I've, um, I've got some guys around me that I think are really, really good at, 
at not not everybody has the five guys sure. that you have though. I mean, sure. they are spectacular. I've met them, but you know, you have to surround yourself with people that actually they're probably better than you, and that's oh, yeah. that's tough. Yeah, it's tough to find. Yeah. Yeah, especially and when, when somebody's not better than me, then they'll just get cut. And we'll we'll slot <laughs> somebody else you're in. Cut from the team. <laughs> but there had to, you know. But but it's true. There's somebody that has to give you those truths as you go along. You're not on this road your own. But to a certain extent, you had to have broken a code. There had to have been a, an aha moment when you're like, "Wow, okay, and now I see the sequence of events and how I need to replicate this." So. Yeah, I think a lot of that for me was there's a moment when you make a sale. Where you, is se- you sell something to someone, they're putting a lot of trust in you. And there were moments where that, that happened, where I made a sale, and then somebody in the organization stopped that. Mm-hmm. And I, I hated that moment so much because I'm like, I told them what we were going to do. Right. And now you're stopping me from delivering on this thing. I've been there. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really painful moment because you've t- given your word. That's painful. Yeah, and you're yeah. the one that has to go and say, "Hey, we're not doing it this way," or I've been told this this now has to be done this other way, and and I think it was a combination of that moment is so painful um, that I never wanted to do that again, and then listening and watching people, um, you know, Mark and Tim here at Fidelis talk about being surrounded by the gray hairs, like mm. find guys with a lot of gray hair because they've learned some things. Yeah. yeah, I've got a lot more. Like compared to Ryan over here, I've got a ton of gray hair. Ryan's got great hair. <laughs> he does have great, great hair, hair, man. Really it's red hair. Really right. phenomenal. Yeah. But how how do you how do you stop those moments where you're like this isn't right how this is happening um, by listening to these guys that have walked that path before mm. and that's. I don't know. I, th- I guess that's the code I tried to break. Like I could have continued down that road and done things by cutting corners or trying to do things wrong. And I'm sure there's still some things that I'm going to do next week where I'm like, I probably shouldn't have done that. You know, <laughs> there's always some learning moments, but I think if I'm intentionally trying to do things that are to the benefit of the client and my team, right. then I think that we're probably on a good path. Well, and, and you're, you're really lucky in that. I was, we were having this conversation in the shop the other day about how a lot of people, entrepreneurs, you know, kind of like we are, and as that, that move forward, they pay for that advice. And we were, we were talking about that it's almost sad that now you pay for a group of peers in order to help you to do that when it used to be something that was just organic between people, Mm -hmm. right? We helped each other and what a fantastic thing it was to help each other. And it wasn't advice that you had to go dump $2,500, $3,000 a month in order to get, Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've really kind of lost that, man. So yeah, man, good on you that you, that you have. Yeah. There's this, there's this concept that, that, uh, the Hebrew culture back, back in the day. And I think even to, to now that, um, if, uh, somebody else is going to quote this better than I am. I'll give you a summation of what I, how I understand this. But in 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 this culture, in the Jewish culture, if you're in a community and there's a guy that uh, that does a thing, like say he paints window designs, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to go hire that person, and he could be terrible at it. He could just be starting out at it. But if you need your window painted in a certain way, uh, you're going to go hire this guy. And he's going to do the job. And if he does it bad, you're going to go tell him how he did it bad. But then you're going to go hire him the next time. And he's going to do a little bit better. And you're going to critique him. But then you're going to go back and you're going to hire him again. And so um, I think for me, it's that idea of like, I've gotten enough of those chances. And there's been enough of those guys around me that if we can all kind of work in that way together, it's a it's a net positive. For oh, all it is. Us. It's, yeah. it's, it's compounding interest mm-hmm. is what it is. Mm-hmm. And that you, you can't get around it, but that is, you know, that, that's kind of what, what drives us to success. It, you know, a lot of people think that, that when you've bootstrapped a business or somehow you've done all this on your own, there's this, there's this weird thought about this rugged individualism and I'm not against rugged individualism. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the <laughs> you day, you seem super rugged to me but <laughs> uh, but you know what even with that take it from my gray hair i have figured out no matter how rugged or tough i may be at the end of the day i can't do this alone sure and and you know it's 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 uh i can tell you some really fun stories about when i have figured this out and, the, and, and when it came to me that that said hey i'm a team guy you know but that's what you're talking about that it takes a team and and more than that it it takes really close friends and it's really hard to make close friends that will do that mm-hmm. right that's it's it's part of that piece of success we've had a lot of people that have been on this podcast and and there's been some that have been awesome and there's been others that you know I, as i told you you know uh sound a lot like a, a business self-help book 
right? It happens. Sure, sure. But at the end, you know, I don't think I've ever had anybody that ever came to me and talked about their close set of friends that tried to get them there. You know, it's, it's, it, that is unique, yeah. you know, in that success formula. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's one of the guys that I would consider a, a close mentor at this point in my life is a gray hair. Uh, he's got a phenomenal story, but he talks about a group versus a team, mm -hmm. a group you're together and it's for everybody's individual needs. Now, most, gr most teams are a group at some level, right? But to really succeed, you know, to win mm -hmm. a championship, you have to have Everybody has to put their individual desires aside to, to better the team. For the greater good. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it, Tim has a – I quote Tim a lot because he's got great lines, but he's like, we don't hire wizards, right? Mm -hmm. You don't hire a don't guy – Don't trust a wizard. Don't trust a wizard, sorry. That's right. um, you know, you, you don't trust a wizard on a team because they're always going to go do their own thing. They're mm -hmm. going to – they think that they don't need anybody else. But to really do good – to really do good work, you've got to have people around you, right. whether that's running a big organization or running a small shop and having oh, yeah. having contractors that are around that you all sort of function together to get the job done. Right. I say this often around here because we are a small team, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for all intents and purposes. But the only difference between between having a large organization and a small organization and the dynamics of how it works is the number of zeros behind that decimal point. Sure. Right. I mean that, or in front of that decimal point. That as that goes. The problems remain the same and the needs remain the same. And and building that that culture is paramount. So tell me about building the culture in your in your business. How what what are you doing now in order to make sure that it runs right? Um yeah, and I'll I'll be the first to admit, so I don't know, people from my team will probably hear this, but <laughs> I don't always do the best job at this. This is the culture side of things is probably where I'm the weakest but what's really great is um there's a guy on our team named joe dalton who's probably the best person at building a team culture of anybody i've ever met or worked with well. yeah and he's he's just so good at being intentional and being relational with people um that honestly i can lean on him to do these things because i know this isn't what i'm good at mm -hmm. um I can say this is how we want to do it. We want to do it with excellence, honor, integrity, and fun, gratitude, and fun. Um, and then he honestly just kind of does it. And so, uh, Joe, if you're hearing this, I really appreciate you. You do a phenomenal job at these things. Well, there's building culture right there. For yeah. yeah. And and I, I, I want the culture of our team to be um, – I want it to represent those four pillars and I want it to be a place that people enjoy being because I've worked jobs that suck. I've done things that mm -hmm. I've worked for people where I'm like, I don't, I don't like this and I don't, I don't ever want that. Right? right. People don't always like you, but I don't want people going home and thinking like Andrew's taking advantage of me. And if people have felt that I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm trying to be better at those things. They, uh, I was brought up to believe that culture, you know, as as we see it today, is you know, funny hats with little spinny things on the top mm -hmm. and ping pong, you know, at at the office. It took me a while to realize that culture was just innate set of behaviors that was shared by the whole group, yeah. good behaviors. Sure. And 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 doing that means you've got to be leading by example one way or the other, right? So what is what are some of the things that you redundantly sets and reps do every day when you come into the office or when you're at the office? Yeah. So we definitely have a weekly team meeting. Mm -hmm. um i'm i don't know that our meetings are the most efficient but it's a good touch point uh we really like a team lunch uh every few weeks a couple weeks a few weeks so just getting together yeah just getting together going to lunch um i know we've got a big all day all afternoon team event coming up in a couple weeks that's going to be a lot of fun um but one of the really cool things about the industry we're in is that we'll we'll travel you know a handful of times a year mm -hmm. and i do think traveling with with people you work with Makes a is a difference. is a way yeah. to really kind of build some connections. Exactly. Like this last week, uh, I took the drive to El Paso, the the West Texas town of El Paso, and that's a long drive. Chris. It is a long drive. I don't know why Texas decided to be this big. Um, it's great in theory, <laughs> but in practice, driving across Texas to El Paso is a is what a. Is it ten hours? It's like ten and a half hours. A half. It's a commitment. Yeah. Um, I could have gotten to Florida in this amount of, and been at a at beach. The beach. <laughs> yeah. Instead, I'm <laughs> in the middle of a desert, right? Yes. Um, Hot desert. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's that, and then, um, like even to the smallest extent of like, hey, we do birthday cards, or we do like work anniversary cards with like a, 
um, a Chick Fil A card or something. It's just those little moments. Being noticed. Yeah, and then one of our guys' wives just had a baby, and so uh, it's on my list for this afternoon to order them a DoorDash gift card, right? Because mm-hmm. I guess you're not really supposed to give people homemade food for babies now. Somebody told me. I don't. Well, I may, know. Maybe this is a thing. Maybe it's not. But um, at least now they can they can kind of order it when they want and not have to right. take it out of the freezer on time or something. Yeah. So. You know, talking about that and being noticed in in the workplace and where it is, man. I, I don't think I could have ever worked corporate. I, 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 the other day, I I called on a corporate client and I had to go into their offices. First time I'd been in their office, downtown Houston. Got, got through security, you know, left my ID, whatever, made sure my, I, I went up to the mm-hmm. top floor. And as I arrived in there, this is post-COVID, so I, I may, people may be working remotely, I don't know. But there was probably a hundred, at least at a least hundred cubicles that were on this floor. And, and it was like one person per every 20 cubicles, and they were there alone. And I would walk by, and I would see them staring at their screen with a sets of papers, you know, clipped together on either side. And I was thinking to myself, they probably sat here for eight hours looking at that screen. <laughs> It sounds terrible to me. It, it sounds terrible. <laughs> so sounds one like of the, the one of the great things about what you do is, and and, and I'm going to give you some kudos because the other day I I saw you at graduation, and uh, in fact you put you got a, a little piece with my son in there who was graduating, but uh, between you and and the team that were. Y'all were barely talking to each other, just moving from place to place, man. It was just like, you know, uh, targets of opportunity. Y'all were po- mm-hmm. yeah, and it was going, and, mm-hmm. and you, you you were sharing. It was it was it was symbolic of of more of an organism than it was anything else right as you moved oh, yeah. and you I haven't thought it, about that yeah. yeah and you were moving in and i was like i was like well hey man they're pretty wired in mm-hmm. right watch how they're doing this this mm-hmm. is really incredible how much b-roll you probably got in that one day just moving fast but, yeah i think yeah, last year i counted and we shot um i think we had like 76 terabytes of content by the wow. end of the year um which you know compared to some teams that's probably pretty small yeah um but you're right like we do try to go out and have a plan and then everybody just kind of functions together to, to accomplish mm-hmm. that. Um, this last week in El Paso, we were shooting this project about flood remediation in the desert, which is a huge problem for this, this small community out there. Um, but I'm out filming and doing some interviews. One of the other guys is out flying the drone and then we're conducting interviews and kind of about it's, it, it's fun, right? It's fun having a team and, and realizing that if you miss something, somebody else is going to see it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And it's good. Well, you know, the thing that I really see here is there had to be a moment, right? So I want to know about these moments. So there, there's a lot of folks out there that are starting a business or they've been running a business or, or they're involved or maybe they're dreaming about starting a business. And, and, and there comes a point in time when you're at work and, and you're leading or maybe you're, you're not leading or maybe you're just involved. But where you come to the term of this is where I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. This is what I was meant to do. When was that epiphany for you? Yeah, I have that epiphany a lot, honestly. Um, that there's there's two projects that stand out in my mind where I real I realize like mm-hmm. this means something. Um, so there's um, and and these are available for free online. But we did a project for the Association of Former Students called Colonel Campbell's um, Final Flight. Um, and then another project called The Lost Letterman, which is on TexAx.com. So Colonel Campbell's Final Flight, um, it's the story of a, a U.S. service, U.S. Air Force pilot who was shot down over Laos when the U.S. wasn't in Laos mm. uh, as a part of the Vietnam War. Um, he was killed in, in the 60s, and then uh, he was repatriated. His, his remains were repatriated in 2017. Um, and as a part of that project, we got to film him coming back to the United States. We got to, and we got to film his burial at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, And then that, that piece was released on Memorial Day in 2017. And there's just something so beautiful about telling a family's story, about getting, helping a family have a little bit of closure Mm -hmm. and telling a story uh, that a lot of people can see that just felt really, really good to me. Um, and then the story of the lost letterman is there was a there's an AM men's soccer team in 1981 who was varsity for half a season then their varsity status got re- revoked and they've never been considered letterman at texas a m university even though they were varsity for half a I season i've never heard this story it's a beautiful wow. film but 
the the team and their coach who was 97 at the time he since passed away i think he was 100 when he passed away but um the team hadn't seen each other in 30 years and so brandon and i and, and clay on our team we went down to el salvador because a couple of guys were from el salvador we film a bunch wow. of the story we filmed some interviews here we put together this piece and then we premiered it for that team uh that that fall and it was the first time these guys had seen each other in 30 years or more and so it was this really fun moment of like bringing people together telling their story watching them kind of understand themselves again or, mm -hmm. or from a different angle and those are the two things that i like that really kind of stand out to me is is bringing people together and giving giving light to a story that might not have had a chance for that and there's a bunch of those those are just the two that kind of stand out to me as, have you always loved storytelling I have always loved storytelling. I don't always consider myself a great storyteller. I think as a dad, I've tried to get better at it because mm -hmm. um, there's there's something about your kids like, hey, tell me a story. Right. And so it's kind of forced me to, to uncover more of that in myself. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's quite a buzzword in marketing today, right? Storytelling. But at the same time, there, there's throughout time, there's been folks that are gifted at it and folks that aren't. Sure. I... It is a buzzword, and it annoys me that everybody's like, I'm a storyteller. I'm like, <laughs> are you really telling a story? Uh -huh. Am I always really telling a story? I don't know. Um, but, I, yeah. I do think it's interesting where, and you know this, like everybody these days, like we have to have a short video. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a short attention span. Your Their attention spans are short. Got to go 30 seconds. A minute is too long. Two minutes, this is ridiculous, right? Well, I would argue that I could find a 30 second video that's less engaging and more boring than a 10 minute video that's got a really good story. Absolutely. You can watch a 10 minute film and if it's engaging and there's a good story, it flies by. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how long it is. Mm -hmm. You can have 30 seconds where you're like, this is a waste of my time. This isn't engaging me. Um, so I, yeah, I, I like to think of myself as a storyteller, but a lot of it is really, is it a good story to start with? Right. Or can we find sort of the interesting Is angle? it worth it? Yeah. yeah, I was so disappointed just personally when Yeti stopped telling their stories. I thought the Yeti stories, uh, and those were told for a long time by a group in New Mexico called Tallweg Productions. And I thought those were some of the most beautiful corporate Absolutely. things I've ever seen. Absolutely. Just sucked you in, didn't yes. it? Yes. They were so well done. I know. I called that guy one day and I was about to book a ticket to yeah. New Mexico just to go, just to go stand in his shop and just learn, you know, mm -hmm. like, just let me learn from you. And he's like, bro, there's nothing real secret to what I'm doing. <laughs> I just hire really good people and they're just really good at what they do. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. There's gotta be it, it. I was close to doing it. And then the guy just seemed not up for it, but one day maybe. Yeah. I love storytelling. Mm -hmm. I love people that can tell a story by video and that you watch it. And, and, and I, I do, I like it 10 minutes. I'd rather, watch a 10 minute 15 minute engaging story than i would a two-hour film that just goes nowhere mm -hmm. right um but i do I, I really do appreciate what you do okay so so you have so you you've had these epiphanies and you were coming through so let's let's go all the way back to when you decided to to leave across the street and you went to work for tex ags who was the first hand that you sh that you got to shake that you thought wow yeah uh, the first contract I signed was uh, with a guy that I now consider a close friend, uh, Randy Reyes at the Association of Former Students. Right. Um, I didn't, my first year back at Tech Sags, after having done a couple of other things, I, I thought there was a business here. I thought we could do something. Um, I didn't really know how it was going to get there, uh -huh. right? The job I had before I came back here, I'd taken on a sales role, even though I told them I never wanted to sell. I got pretty good at it, but I'd never, I'd never just sold video. There was always some other components to what I was selling. So I was like, I think we can do this, right? And I remember sitting in the, the conference room in our, in our building, and Randy was across the table. And I remember just having yeah. that like ideation, and we were just kind of talking and pitching ideas back and forth. Um, and then he, he emails me later that day or that week. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to go with you. I'm really excited to do this work. And I remember going home and like giving my wife this huge hug because it was the biggest contract I had ever sold to that point. Um, and it was just like, it was the idea that somebody was willing to jump on board with this crazy kind of vision I had. Um, it was a really meaningful moment to me. Right. And now Randy and I have worked together for seven years and he's probably annoyed with me. Or sure. some, you know, I love <laughs> Randy, but... Um, 
It's uh, been a really great productive relationship. We've gotten to do some of the best projects that we, my team has ever been a part of have been for Randy. Uh, I've traveled around the country with that guy. Like we were in Fort Rucker, Alabama, driving on four wheelers with kids getting pulled on pieces of carpet. It was super weird, but <laughs> you know, we've got, yeah. Uh, so he was the first person that I ever shook hands with and really? did a deal. Yeah. I, I, I did not know this story. Yeah. 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 I did not know this relationship. Yeah. He, uh, I think he takes great pride in that, that he kind of <laughs> helped me get going. But, yeah. and then at the same time we signed another project with, with a neighborhood down in Milliken, uh, and got to make a really beautiful 10 minute film about this new development right. that was going in there. And that was, that was one of those pieces too, where I kind of look back, I'm like, I did that. Like, this was like one of the first things we did. How cool is this? You know? Right. So. It, well, it's funny how when you start to win, that winning is contagious. And yeah. just one after another will start to hit. Sometimes it only takes just one. Yeah. Right. It's, it is interesting because when you do something that's good, um, yeah. like a uh, guy, guy that used to work for us, doing really great things on his own now, Clay Taylor, directed a film for us called Gilly back in 2019. I think it was pre-COVID. Um, but really great story about Colin Gillespie, who was a 12th man at Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. He was the first 12th man who was ever drafted into the NFL in the seventh round by the Houston Texans. Uh, this film goes out, and I'm like, God, this took a ton of time. I don't know how we're going to make money on this thing. But we got so many calls and emails over the next month and a half wow. just because people saw that and wanted to do something for their business. And so, right. uh, yeah, you never know really what's going to bring work in, but – it's it's always fun when you put something out in the world that you poured a lot of sweat and tears and right. passion into, and it people are like, "Hey, we want to pay you money now." It's like, "Well, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I need well, to make something." So, so correct me if I'm wrong. I may be off on this one. Don't you do a little philanthropic work, doing some videos here and there for folks that yeah, are kind of pro bono? Yeah, we try to. Um, my feeling is, I always want to partner with organizations that are doing good work, mm. and I'm not always able to do it for free just because there's so much time sure. that goes into stuff. But I do try to meet organizations at whatever budget they can kind of set. Um, you know, it's not unusual to get into a video project. And if it's something big, you're in the tens of thousands of dollars. Quick. Um, yeah, it can happen really quick. And for nonprofits, I understand that that's not always possible. But if a group has a little bit of budget set aside, I try my best to do the work and to do it with, excellence honor gratitude and fun for kind of whatever their budget number is mm -hmm. um just because if there's people out there doing good work i they're working their butts off and i want to support them and and uh we're doing work for voices for children right now we're doing some stuff for sos ministries uh we've done work for a lot of nonprofits in this community and it's always really fun to kind of give them something yeah. that's that at least represents a much higher budget number than they would have been able to afford. And so it's just something that I really like to do. It's awesome. It is. But then again, people see that and that you're doing the right thing. And it, yeah. Yeah, it helps. That's the hope, right? That's the hope. Yeah. <laughs> That's the hope for sure. Well, speaking of hope, what, what are you hoping for next in the business? Where's it going? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're, we're in the process of finishing up a story uh, that will release – hopefully in the fall uh it's a story of hugh mcelroy who was the first uh black football player at texas a&m right. to start and score a touchdown against lsu in i think 1971 uh it's a story of his family and um him him getting sort of metaphorically kicked out of the family and then brought back into the fold so that's going to be really beautiful over the fall the plan is to do sort sort of a a multi-stop tour around the state of texas to premiere that which will be really cool uh, along with whatever other kind of distribution we can get. Um, but other than that, I, I really, we've been doing a lot of live work lately, which is fun and super stressful as Ryan can attest to over here, like right. turning stuff on for live <laughs> can be hard. Right, Ryan. Yeah. Um, so I like kind of pushing the boundaries in that, in that respect as well. Um, and then kind of the next, the next big project we've got coming up is a really fun one where, uh, we're doing an NIL uh, we have a client in town that's paying money for the production of a series of commercials that we'll release uh, later in July. But we're also combining that with an NIL play through a stacked product at Texas, where we're paying some athletes to come and be 
yeah. have their name. Can't believe we're even us. saying that on on super weird super that we can weird, do legit. this. Yeah, I'm like I'm thinking, but of it's gold. completely legal, and we've the lawyers have looked at the contracts. I'm thinking good. of Gold Trans Ams, but I'm showing my age at Man, this point in time. If we could give Gold Trans Ams still, if that's all it took, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, you know what comes to mind here is is I've, I've got a when this is done, I've got a few ideas for you, but uh, when you were talking about, you know, the, the documentary kind of you were doing, and I think t- I was thinking to myself the other day about Terry Price. I was like, I hope somebody tells his story, man, man you know, he's just, uh, that guy has been so, so huge at Texas A&M produced so much, but you talk to everybody that ever, that he ever touched and they have nothing but great things to say. Yeah. It's not often that, um, that everybody has really great things to say about coaches. You're right. kind of around athletic circles enough. You hear people yeah. just say people get burned one way or another, right. right? And that's just people. But I never got to know Ter- I never got to know Coach Price. But everybody that I've ever met, even before he passed away tragically uh, at a way too young an age, but uh, nobody's ever said anything bad about that guy. Mm-hmm. I've seen tons of posts online about a Terry Price memorial memorial barbecue cook off. <laughs> I hope somebody actually pulls that off. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that, when that I saw it, it kind of threw me off because Terry Price and I are the same age. And so as I'm looking, I'm like, wow, I'm, that's way too young. Yeah, I just. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard, hard to think about that yeah. for sure. All right, man. So one big question to you here at the yeah. end of this. What is success to you? How do you define success? You've, you've told a lot of things that you're doing great. And all, I mean, people – Surely you would have to be envious with what you've been able to accomplish and how you live and what you get to do and, and, and how you lead yourself through that. But what, how do you define success? I love that question because 20-year-old Andrew would have answered that in a very different way than yeah. 38-year-old Andrew is going to try to answer it now. Um, I think at the end of my life, I'm not going to think, God, I really wish I had spent more time working. And that's a cliche <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> I, it's so true. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, but I look at, I'm trying to take a much longer view. I don't want, I don't want my family working on something that I can accomplish in my lifetime. I want my kids and my grandkids and their grandkids working on a legacy that is more reminiscent of um, something that Abraham would have set up for his family, right? And so um, right now, I want success to be, I've got a special needs son, right? Mm-hmm. Um, success for me right now would be spinning up a business that he could take over one day or work in and would support him, right? Wow. Success to me uh, is potentially, you know, when my daughters get married, running an organization big enough that I can just sort of envelop their husbands, uh, you know, oh, hey, you're an attorney, Beautiful come thing. on. Come on, come work with me. I got, I got a spot for you. We'll, we'll, we'll fold you into the family business here. Um, but I, I want my. I, I think success for me is going to be measured um, on a. It's measured on a much longer timeline. And so for me, it's how do I set a trajectory that allows my family, um, not necessarily to be rich. Like I'll take as much money as I can get. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Money's money is fuel, and I'll take as much fuel it's as I fuel. can get. Um, but I want my family set on a trajectory where we're working to accomplish some things that make the world a better place. And the, my seal, the ceiling I'm going to reach is the floor for my kids. And so I want to push that ceiling as high as I can get because I want them to start at a level where I would have never dreamed. Right. No, I totally understand. That's not really a direct answer to your question, but that's, that's very much how I think about this thing. Well, it's funny. So we've talked to a lot of business people here. And, and inevitably, there's, there's been a percentage um, that, that their idea of success was to grow their business and to be able to sell it so they didn't have to work again. Sure, that'd be great. But then you also have the other side that's much like where you're at, which is the legacy side, right? To leave that legacy through being able to provide even when you're no longer there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I, I, look, I'd love to sell a business. Selling a service business like a video company is a little bit harder. Right. Maybe one day I'll have And I can get a 20X. Yeah, maybe one day I'll have a product business that can sell for huge multipliers. That'd be cool. Um, but I do think about um, just that long-term view mm-hmm. of, you know, Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 7.9 says um, that he, he gives a blessing to a thousand generations. And I could be quoting that wrong. I think that's what it is. But the, 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 the essence is that a curse 
in ancient in, in the Bible is for three generations, two to three generations. But a blessing goes on for a thousand, right? So how do I bless as many people, especially my little family, to go for a thousand generations? Like right. let's have a five hundred year view. That's yeah. that's the view I want is five hundred years from now. Awesome. That's a win. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it seems like all of us are winning. Yeah. Yeah. We need you to tell Ryan's story. Man, Ryan, Ryan, I'll tell you something about Ryan Blair. And I, I mean this. Ryan is a man that's ahead of his generation. He's an old soul, man. His generation yeah. is going to catch up to him <laughs> in the next three to five years. Uh-huh. And they're going to realize, this guy's got some stuff going on <laughs> that we need. Yeah. He's just got to yeah. be patient enough to wait for the rest of his cohort to catch up. Yeah. They'll be there someday. Something and then he's going to he's gonna be there like, hey, guys, the water's <laughs> fine. Come on in. Come It'll on in. Yeah. Hey, by the way, he's, he's going to be the one. Hey, been there, done that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, Absolutely. That's the key. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks for being on. Absolutely. And, you know, I, it's been great being on the Deep Dark Podcast. I'm glad you had me on, Chris. Uh-huh. Um, you can catch all of our shows on Spotify, Apple, uh, your wh- wh- whatever <laughs> podcast uh, aggregator you want to use. Perfect. Um, yeah. I don't know how else to close your show. I tried, but I kind of No, fizzled. I think you got it. I think you got it. Yeah. Listen to it. Share it. You know, be like Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> be like Andrew. That that that's a goal there. The good ways. Yeah, like in the good ways. We we yeah. don't we we didn't discuss the the ways we don't want. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Thanks.